Why do we modify cars? Is that out of habit or routine? Or is it merely a way to pass the time while we wait for approval and acceptance from our peers for doing something they thought we should do in the first place? Maybe it's that we have a need to create something that reflects our own ideas, dreams, desires, and emotions. Or maybe there's just nothing better to do. This clearly isn't a restoration, and ironically, it's not a typical resto mod. It's definitely not the build the internet has been waiting for. In fact, it's not even using an engine or car that most people know about. So why do it? It's because this car is a part of our lives and stories. It's part of our past and brings to the table something we've always wanted to experience. It's because of the joy of the build, father and son learning new trades and working together for a common goal. It's because we want our GT6 to be the modernized and powerful Grand Tour that we as normal human beings can actually afford to have in our driveway. It's because we're fanatic builds. If you haven't yet, subscribe so you won't miss anything. I think it's safe to say what started out as an engine swap has snowballed into a slightly more significant project. Nevertheless, our custom chassis is now largely together. The Corvette rear end is in place, and last time we designed and fabricated a cradle to locate our new front suspension components, which were unceremoniously lifted from a Ford Crown Victoria. We found out there is quite a lot of calculations, geometry, and packaging constraints that factor into suspension design. Like, a lot a lot. But always up for a challenge, we've worked through everything one step at a time, and I think it's dialed in pretty well so far. Apparently though, we've got something wrong. We had to tip our lower control arms out at the back for clearance to the engine, and I was sure this would cause issues. It didn't though. Apparently, because this is how it's supposed to be in the first place. Additionally, whilst going through some other comments, we noticed a few of you think this project is lacking something. Lacking something. Uh, brackets? Right. Well, wait no longer, because today we need to build a whole bunch of brackets for the upper control arms, rear of the lower arms, and even some to mount our steering rack. Mm. Are those really going to be brackets though, or just mounts? Because technically isn't a bracket a thing that bolts to another thing in order to hold something else? I just wouldn't want you spreading wrong information if what you're actually building are things that are welded to another thing in order to hold something else. Okay. Well, depending on your definition then, today we're going to be building some mounts. First on the agenda are the upper control arm holding things. These weedy temporary ones were fabricated last time and allowed us to locate the arms in a suitable position for the geometry and clearances we need. But their time has come. So with all the complicated messing around taken care of, let's plow on with building the real ones. This is quarter inch or about six millimeter plate, which is not exactly the most fun material to cut with an angle grinder, but uh, well, we don't exactly own a plasma cutter, partly due to the expense and partly due to space, but mostly because we know you'd rather see us struggle. There are slightly different CAD templates for the front and rearmost mounts, and we'll need two of each, so let's press on. They have been designed to hang over the side of the frame rails for extra durability and also because the control arm mounting point isn't actually centered on the rail in the first place. With one bolt pushed back a bit and a new mount slid into place, you can hopefully see how these are a pretty effective solution to take up the anti-dive angle of the arms whilst keeping things neat and tidy. Now from factory, the Crown Victoria's lower control arms were the ones that altered camber. But we're going for a slightly different approach, with the uppers being adjustable instead. This is because our entire hood and wheel wells hinge out of the way, and the upper mounts are by far easier to access. To make them adjustable though, we will need slotted holes to allow the M14 mounting bolts to slide in and out. At this point, admittedly, the whole basic hand tool no plasma cutter thing might have been a bit short-sighted, as our only technique available is to drill two small holes, progressively working up to 14 millimeters, and then filing by hand the remaining material until it's an oval. Yeah. 
yeah, we should at least get some carbide burrs, but with the front and rear mounts taken care of and tacked in place, we are finally able to remove the temporary supports from the middle and see how it is all working out. With merely half an inch of travel, we've got a decent amount of camber change, which is perfect. Some eccentric plates will eventually lock the arms in place, but for now, this gets us on our way. Also, as it's the upper arms that do the adjusting now, do note that dialing in some negative camber pulls in the top of the tire rather than pushing out the bottom, which will give us a little more fender clearance if we absolutely need it later on, but that technique's kind of a last resort. Carrying on. Our cardboard templates have been modified for the inner mounts, and after another session with the faithful grinder, there's all the remaining ones looking pretty sharp. Gotta say, this design is turning out just as I'd hoped. Each mount falls on the same line, and are nice and even from side to side. The freshly minted inner mounts have now been marked up and drilled as well, but without the filing completed just yet, so you can see how each hole cleanly lines up with the first set of mounts, giving us maximum and minimum camber changes. Of course, with some more elbow grease, they too get finished up and tacked in place. Beautiful. Fully welding them will come later, as I've got something up my sleeve. And we may also add some braces to tie each pair of mounts together, but we'll leave it like this for now. There's only the lower rear mounts left to complete at this point, so I guess it makes sense to push on with those. Let's start by drilling and tapping some more pieces of quarter-inch plate so our polyurethane bushings will have something to bolt to. For additional strength, we'll also add some captive nuts and mount all of that to some 2x3 off stands. They have been cut at an appropriate angle to mirror that of the front control arms. And the other angle here is to allow for maximum clearance to our Jeep bell housing. Clearance is really the point of all this, as unfortunately the factory Crown Vic mounts were just too ridiculously massive to use. With the sides chamfered, we can now remove the zinc coating from the nuts and start welding. The saying goes, if you can't make it right, make it bright. But I, for one, kind of prefer both, and these should fit that bill nicely. The inside has received a coat of rust converter, of course, and as with the rest of the frame, we will eventually drill some drain holes to allow water out and oil spray in. After sliding the mounts onto the control arms, a straight edge is used to help align them to the frame, and after some checking, they can both get tacked in place. A quick note on those bushings. The brackets that they came with are 1 8 inch material, which we're pretty sure is going to be more than adequate for the tasks we are going to ask of them. However, we have had a few concerned individuals mention they think they're a bit on the spindly side. So just know, we'll be leaving them like this for now, but are considering options to beef them up later on in the build. Now, back to the show. With the engine and transmission in place again, you can finally see the clearances we've been going on about. Or lack of clearances, depending on how you look at it. Like with everything else, it's pretty bloomin' tight, but frankly, still better than we expected. On the driver's side, there is now an oil filter relocation adapter fitted, as, unfortunately, a full-size filter won't quite fit around the control arm. But we're going to use this to our advantage later, and the relocation kit is the first step. In the meanwhile, though, I think we can take a breath. Not gonna lie, getting this front suspension set up has been a ridiculous amount of work, and some of you are probably wondering why anyone in their right minds would have bothered to do it, but perhaps you just answered your own question. Anyway, having all the mounting points finally firmed up has taken a huge weight off our shoulders and means we can finally push on with the next step. Yeah, steering rack. That'll be interesting. Indeed it will. And I did say we were gonna do that. 
actually missing some parts. So, uh, maybe something else. Shocks and springs? No. Sway bar? No. Well, just tell me I don't got all day. Motor mounts. I've decided. Okay then, motor mounts. This should be interesting. To get a better idea of what we're working with, the exhaust manifolds have been put on again, and all that room we had just a minute ago seems to have vanished. However, if you squint, there's still plenty of space for activities, it just doesn't really look like it. Hidden away in there is actually the beginnings of the passenger side mount. Yet another quarter inch plate has been drilled to the bolt pattern of our LS4 block, and fresh hardware is securing it in place. Quick heads up to those interested. Although the LS4 was mounted transversely, it still uses largely the same mounting points as a normal LS. The driver side is identical, and the passenger side just has half as many options. The ones remaining though are still in the typical location. Designing engine mounts isn't just a matter of slamming some metal together and moving along. As once again for this build, there are some factors to consider. Mainly, the angles of the universal joints on the center prop shaft. We mentioned this topic very briefly in episode 15, but let's just take a second here to cover it more in depth. The joints need to be at equal and opposite angles to each other, else witchcraft will cause vibrations that can damage the drivetrain and kill you. Okay, it's not witchcraft, just weird mechanical principles, but the death thing's no joke. Let's demonstrate. Please excuse the crudity of this model. Notice I've got two U-joints and a motor that runs at a constant speed. There is a height difference, but the ends are parallel, making the angles oppose each other. If you listen, you can hear that all three locations are running at even speeds. However, if I angle only one side, it creates a pulsation further down the driveline. Pretty weird. It all comes down to phasing. Universals are not constant velocity joints. They operate in an ellipse, and without a second joint opposing the first one, that ellipse will transfer torque at an oscillating speed. That applies to this scenario, but if we remove just one UJ and rotate it 90 degrees out of phase, this is also no good. Adding to the complexity, there is a minimum and maximum angle these joints can safely run, with the universally accepted range being between 0.5 and 3 degrees. Okay, that's all great information, but how do you find that angle? With the drive shaft in place, you can easily measure the angle of the engine, drive shaft, and differential. Note whether each are pointing up or down relative to the front of the car, and use a calculator like this one from Spicer to easily determine the U-joint angles. But if, like us, you don't have a drive shaft yet, how does that work? Well, we already know that things need to be parallel on either end of the shaft, and if you imagine a right triangle in the middle, the small side is the height difference over the length of the long side, and the hypotenuse and its corresponding angle define the drive shaft. So, measure from the floor to the diff yoke, and subtract that length from the floor to the transmission slip yoke. The difference is side A, bearing in mind your floor may not be level. Measure from the center of the output to input yokes, for C, and ignore B, as we don't actually need it. Some trigonometry will find our angle, and armed with that, we can use the calculator tool again to find out where we sit. It's then just a matter of playing around with everything until the U-joint angles come into spec. Simple. Since episode 15, we've had all this figured out whilst keeping the engine as low as possible to reduce our center of gravity. Unfortunately though, that's biting us in the butt now, as with the control arm mounts in place, we have less clearance than we were expecting. So, we're gonna have to do a bit of rejigging. Lifting the engine and transmission up will keep things parallel and get us our clearance, but we'll put the U-joints on too much of an angle. The solution then is to lift only the front of the engine and reflect this change in angle to the differential to keep things parallel. We already made the diff's front mount in episode 13, and although we incorporated a small amount of adjustment, it's sadly not enough. So, I think you know what's coming next. Yes, we're taking the grinder to our beautiful mount. 3 16ths of an inch has been removed, which should allow plenty of adjustment, 
So after some cleanup and chamfering, it gets welded up again and put back in its home. Unfortunate, but at least it was an easy fix. Carrying on then, another quarter inch plate is marked up for the second engine mount and can get drilled for the M10 hardware. Exactly what we're looking for. So we've got these bushings here that we're going to be mounting the engine with. Steel sleeve on those, and we need a standoff for them to meet up like that and then go down to the frame. We've drawn a little black line there, and we're just going to fish mouth it out. If we had a proper uh, tube cutting uh, kit, it would make life a little bit easier, but we're just going to do it the old fashioned way with our good old friend, the angle grinder. There's a classic example of Panasonic's depth to defocus having a little problem, but you can't argue with our results. It's really not a bad fit for a rough cut. We'll need to flop it down, but uh, that's the idea. It's pretty good. With a bit more work, here's the rest of the engine mount jigsaw puzzle. It's such a fiddle with all the little parts. Here, we've got one that was in the oven already. This will get welded up like so, and that fished mouthpiece will be attached here to bring the mounts down to the chassis. It would be great if all four of these quarter inch plates could be exactly the same. So let's deploy the flat disc yet again in an effort to achieve that. Next, they get marked up and sent to the drill press for some further subtractive manufacturing. Some of our specialty cutting fluid. So we got a little bit of a... That's interesting. Yeah. It's good to try that right now. Just a burr or... Gotta get enough of those burrs off and chance again. Oh, isn't that interesting? I think there's just a little bit of difference. Between the 916 step and the 916 drill bit. Yep. Hokey Dyna, the shine level is off the charts. We've got some steel sleeves set up in there to define the width, and a few Sharpie lines will make sure we keep everything positioned properly during welding. Alrighty, it was a little fun getting the torch into those corners, but I think they turned out okay. We also fought a bit of distortion due to dumping all the heat into only one side of the main plate. And if we had a chill block, we would have used it, but we didn't, so we couldn't. Nonetheless, a few swift whacks with a sledgehammer brought it back straight again, and although a bit barbaric, it was an effective stress relief, and it worked well for the parts too. I guess there's not much left to do now other than get some rust converter on those. Ah, good stuff. I must say, those are some beefy looking mounts that should have no problems handling our power level. So, with the engine side done, let's push on with the chassis side. There's that tubing from earlier again. We've spent some time fiddling with some shims to get this sleeve level, and I've verified that with a machinist square. A bit of angle iron helps hold the fish mouthpiece nice and straight, so we can verify it too, and tack it all together. After repeating for the other side, there they are. Yeah, not the prettiest welds, but they are shiny. The two pieces of angle iron in the middle will be welded to the other ends of the tubing, so we can bolt each assembly to the frame. Kind of like so. The first bracket has been cut down to fit in here now, which was a bit of an 
onerous task, but we're pleased with the location and design of it. It's nicely squared to the engine from the front, which being a 90 degree V8 means we're also 45 degrees to the side of the frame. And because the engine angles down two and a half degrees to the rear, we machined that in as well, which gets everything fitting snugly together. So all good then. That defines the angles, and we just need to grind back another 3 16ths of an inch to allow the angle iron to fit. The engine does rock around a bit if we're not careful though. So first, let's repeat all this on the passenger side to confirm everything remains where we need it, and we'll come back to finishing them off in a second. With both in place, we had to quickly pop the exhaust manifolds back on to see how things are looking. And my goodness, that's an LS4 and a GT6. <sighs> I'm sorry, but it just gets me sometimes when I stand back and think about what we've done. It's definitely a huge accomplishment seeing Pontiac, Jeep, Ford, and Triumph all living together in perfect harmony. With the manifolds in place, hopefully you can see just how much more room there is between them and the upper control arm mounts now that the engine has been positioned higher. can actually slip the palm of my hand between there now, so that's a huge improvement and I have no worries of it ever making contact. After ripping the manifolds out again, we've now got some holes drilled in the angle iron and main frame rails in preparation for some captive nut plates. This way, the mounts are removable, which will make pulling the engine a whole heck of a lot easier. The plates then need to get fished down the chassis legs with some wire, bolted on, and some plug welds will secure them in place permanently. And there you go, folks. They're tacked in a few places now, so nothing will move, and those, I think you'll agree, are not just mounts, but brackets. For the very first time then, the new engine is actually bolted to the frame, which is absolutely amazing, and I think a good place to wrap things up. Done. Yay! Next time we'll be re-engineering the steering rack, so subscribe and hit the bell. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoy what we're up to, please help us out by sharing the series with some friends. Huge thanks to our awesome patrons and PayPal donators for their support. It really means a lot and does help out. If you'd like to see the next video a day early, please check out the link on the screen or in the description, and we'll catch you next time.